Have you struggled with trying to determine how do I leave my job, the job that I've been dependent upon for my income for all of my working career up to this point, right? Maybe you've had multiple jobs, but to some level you've been dependent upon it. Maybe there's just been different um, resources, different investments that you've made up to this point that you've been dependent upon. And the idea of getting out of those Stop doing the 401k, right? Stop investing in the market. All of those things that we talk about on a regular basis that have become so easy for us, but seem so hard for you because you've depended upon those right or wrong up to this point. And you wonder, what does independence look like? Will independence serve me? Well, this interview today with one of our, our members, Ben Busick, he's actually going to share with you both how dependence and independence literally saved his life. Let's jump in right now. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Wealth Without Wall Street Tribe, so grateful to introduce to you one of our Inner Circle Plus members, Ben Busick. Ben, so glad to have you on the show today. Thank you, uh, Joey, Russ, it's great to be with you. Thank you. All right. You know the drill, bro. Every single time we bring somebody on the show, we ask the tough question, take people right to the climatical moment of transformation. And I don't know if this is it, but it was a very interesting story. So you're you're on a four-wheeler. You're going up a, a, a very small um, mountain road. You're thousands of feet up. Your bride is behind you uh, on the four-wheeler, and you... You turn the corner and you hit a rut in the road. What happens next? Yeah. So this was just a um, a year ago from from when we were recording, and scariest thing imaginable. You know, you're out of control, and you're a four wheeler with your the person that trusts you on the back end of it, and you're flying off the side of the mountain. At that point in time, the convoy of ATVs and side by sides were going up that mountain. Uh, we were the last ones. And so my immediate concern was that we were by ourselves and we were going to be ourselves by ourselves for a long time. Uh, last thing I remember is trying to splurge something out to my wife. Hold on, you know, here we go, something to that effect. And I remember her launching off the side of the, the right side of the vehicle. And uh, next thing I remember, I came to and I was laying on the side of a mountain and I couldn't move. And it was the most excruciating pain. Um, I tried to move my eyes just to see where I was and what was around me. I saw the ATV to my left. It had been stopped by trees and shrubs. Uh, and I noticed that I was leaning against a, tri a tree as well, a small tree. Um, and I was able to hear my wife grunting because she couldn't get anything out. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get any noise out. Uh, but she was in that tree that I was leaning up against, kind of like a crepe myrtle sized tree. It was at that moment that I realized we are alone. And I was completely helpless. And for anybody that, you know, believes in control or want, you know, that, that there's capable of being in control of, of instance, uh, um, it was, I was completely helpless. Thankfully, um, we heard some voices and unbeknownst to me at the time, but later I found out that the tour guide and the owner of the um, bed and breakfast we were staying at, they had come up around the the bend of the mountain just in time to see us fly off the edge. Um, and so they were, they were able to come and start to try to find us, but because the pitch of the mountain was so steep, it was a very, very steep, um, mountain. They couldn't see us. And that kind of began the, the rescue effort. Um, luckily, you know, this was a marriage retreat. And so we had a lot of special bonding on this marriage retreat. It was with, with other special operations couples. And to make a long story short, Amy and I laid there on the side of the mountain for two hours before help was able to get to us because of the remoteness of this mountain in Montana. These 
the couples that were on the retreat that just a few days before were, were strangers to us, but we had a commonality, our military service together. Um, they went into rescue mode and Amy and I became the mission. They, they saved our lives. They brought us up that mountain, a lot of heroism that day. Um, they were able to secure a satellite phone because cell phones didn't work out in that, in that area. And, uh, about two hours after the accident is when we were finally airlifted one helicopter at a time, um, out of that area and brought to a hospital. At this point, we had already been away from our family for a week and, um, immediately the guide retreat, who was also a military veteran in the special operations community, reached out to my chain of command, my family, and, uh, everybody went to work there. And I would pause anytime you want, please cut in. Cause I don't want to talk and, and take up all the space, but, uh, that's when we got to the hospital and the most amazing support flew into our family, our great friends, successes of our family that are also our neighbors, um, a gentleman I served with too, they created a meal train and within 12 hours, uh, family, friends, my daughter's some team, like our community, they filled up that meal train. 60 days worth of, of meals for our family in, in just a mere 12 hours. So um, you're you're in Montana, Idaho when this happens, and you guys live where? And we live in Virginia, and so you're we're across the country. Completely a- across the country, and your, your kids are in Virginia, across the country, and you're in Idaho now in a hospital, completely dependent upon healthcare providers to take care of your life, while at the same time, completely dependent upon friends, neighbors, strangers to some degree to take care of your kids. It's a, yes, it's a completely humbling experience because, um, not like could Amy and I not function, move, walk or anything. We were completely dependent on the healthcare workers to help us just live day to day. We were completely and totally dependent on family and friends. We were fortunate enough to have family lined up while we were on our week-long retreat to take care of our family, our kids, um, take them to school, practices, what have you. But now that got extended. And for an additional three weeks, for a total of a whole month, we were away from our our kids. We were away from our dogs and people that... uh, So I want to take a step back. I feel like, especially in our community uh, and the inner circle, um, we, we want to give, we want to help others. You know, we want to, um, we really want to see people go to the next level. You never expected to come back to you until you, you are dependent. Like you were, we, Amy and I were literally dependent on just day to day functions, let alone our kids. I mean, one of the, one of the things that I will never, ever forget and all of these be appreciative is my, um, uh, my oldest, he's a teenager at the time. He was a freshman in high school. He recognized the brevity of the situation. And even in the lunchroom of his high school cafeteria, when we got the ability to call him because we could physically talk to him in front of all of the other high school students, he would still say, mom, dad, I love you. And I'll talk to you tomorrow at lunch. And because that was what, what his schedule permitted. But um, to have the courage to have that relationship with his mom and dad in front of, uh, yeah, we've all been through high school, so we know how that could be difficult, but, um, I was just so proud of him for, for that and, and nothing against all right, everybody, everybody had that. My, my mother-in-law, she was amazing. Um, my daughter and my other son, everybody was just so thankful and grateful and supportive. And we were completely help, you know, and incapable of doing anything on our own. So we were very dependent on everybody. It was, a difficult process to include, um, you know, the second time that I almost lost Amy in one week, you know, the second time in one week, I almost lost my bride. We were completely dependent on others. I couldn't save her. And from somebody that spent 21 of 23 years of their military career in special operations, it's not really something that you train for. You expect to influence the situation. You expect to be able to do something and I could do nothing. And so it was a very humbling time for, for me as a person and then our family as a whole. And there's, there's no doubt. And it's, it's amazing to hear this story. And it is like, as you mentioned, it's humbling. You know, I just, I want to challenge you tribe as you're listening to Ben, where would your tribe be 
in the event of a situation like this in your life, right? Do you have the infrastructure, the community around you that would be able to step in for a month unexpectedly and take care of the people who are dearest to you when you're completely unable to be able to be there for them? Like, that's a that's a takeaway from this episode, tribe. Like, if you don't have that, you have an opportunity to build that, right? And that's a shout out to you, Ben, and your bride that you guys are the type of people that someone would step in and do that for. Um, that's amazing. And and I don't I don't want to like shift to passive income specifically, but I know from talking to you that you have a land business and talk about what was happening during that time, you know, you had this land business, what was happening while you were unable to, you know, even hardly live? Yeah. Thanks, Joey. Um, I I want to, I want to start off by saying like, we didn't even understand how wealthy we truly are. You're, you know, our having our health and then the community that we have, man, we are so, so fortunate. Um, and because of, because of our situation, you know, as, as we're as we're looking for financial freedom, as we're looking to, um, you know, myself, I'm retiring from the military very soon, and so what's next for me? Um, I started a land business. I started. Um, I followed the teachings of, of the land geek, and I uh, I jumped into that. And um, because of the maturity of my business, and it's still, as Mark would say, a baby land business. Uh, because of the maturity of it, though, I'd already outsourced a lot of help because I knew I couldn't. I couldn't do it all on my own. I was floored um, at my my assistants, my my team members on my land business. Even though I was being fed food by nurses, my land business was still moving because of my team. They were still closing deals. They were still, um, uh, you know, moving deeds and making things happen. Um, with with little or no guidance, and that's not a testament to me. It really is a testament to the people that I've been able to surround myself with. If you find the right people, you hold on to those type of people. Well, it is a testament to you because you help build that team. You help give those systems for them to follow, and them executing is a result of how you know how structured they they are individually, but also the structure that you gave them. There's a lot that we could unpack in this 30 minutes. And if we had way more than 30 minutes, but I, I want to, I want to draw a parallel right now. Someone, the person listening to you might have been and might currently be dependent upon their, their W2, right? W2 for, for their income and being independent seems really scary and difficult. Right. And for you, you've, you lived a life in, in both camps. And so I, I want to kind of, you know, break this out a little bit, if you will. So up until this point, right. And being dependent upon healthcare providers, being dependent upon friends and families and neighbors, uh, to take care of your children, being dependent upon your, your land VAs to take care of your land business. How would you have looked at dependence up until that point? That's a great question, man. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, always had wanted to be an independent person since, since a very little person, my mom would tell you that I would answer the phone as a little kid. This is, uh, this has been and like, Oh, can we speak to an adult? I am a young adult. Uh, I've always wanted to be independent. I, I've, I've worked really hard to be that. But what I realized when I came to understand is, you know, fast forwarding to my military service, um, the stakes are high. The stakes are really, really high, especially in times of, of conflict. And you have to be dependent. You have to trust the people around you. That's a, that's a pretty profound thing. Cause again, the stakes are high. Um, that is a little bit of a different dependence than on the golden handcuffs of a W2 though. I think, I think we all want to have a level of independence. And, um, I, sorry if I'm steering away from the conversation, I'd, um, but the, the dependence portion of it is, yeah, I, I've been dependent on the military. I've been dependent on my mates to my left and right for a very long time. 
and I had to be dependent on people saving our lives and maintaining our family. All the while, the the inner rebellious person that I've that I that I have is always seeking independence. And so, um, you know, maybe maybe there's something to be taken away from here that they coexist: independence and dependence. <laughs> If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the passive income operating system, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income it makes all the steps come together if you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener we've never given this away in public before go to what's what street.com forward slash p-i-o-s there was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying pop quiz day why because you were unprepared are you unprepared though for financial freedom don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30 second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. Oh, there's there's no doubt. And well, I love the the theme of looking at your life as we have um, off off camera, off um, podcast. You've actually shared with me and and Russ, and I think even some people listening would say, man, it sounds like he's been really lucky, you know, like Hey, you've mentioned that. Hey, I was really lucky. What does that mean to you? Like, how how does luck play into this scenario? Luck for me, it, I, I, there's a, a philosopher, um, Seneca's Roman philosopher, says that luck is when the opportunity meets preparation. And I consider myself lucky because I've poured a lot into my preparedness. Back to the uh, con- maybe controlling my environment or uh, uh, att- attempting to to be the person that makes everything happen. So um, I, I've, I've been prepared mentally, physically, spiritually, and I can't explain it any other way than luck that when those opportunities have presented themselves, I found myself in a, in a position to take that opportunity. Um, anything from my, my investing to my acceptance into this community to just being, I feel like I'm a lucky person because of my desire to improve, to improve myself, to, to improve people around me. My love language is service. And so if I am serving others or a higher cause, that's my best version of myself. And when I'm in alignment with that, when I'm prepared for that, those opportunities just make themselves available. I, I like it too. If I'm going to buy a Toyota Camry, I as soon as I tell my subconscious mind that, I start seeing every single Toyota Camry on the road, whether it's green, purple, red, whatever. Ooh, that silver one's kind of nice. Oh, maybe that gold champagne color is my ticket. I don't know. But you see every single one on the road. And that's what I'm trying to communicate is that once you have prepared yourself, those opportunities are are vast and you see them everywhere. Um, but it's also team sport. And I think that's where it comes into that dependence of others. Your preparation, share what were some of those things that you've done to prepare yourself? I think goal setting is a huge piece of that. I think knowing where you want to go. Um, so in um, in the special operations community, there's always a tryout type of thing, uh, selection process. Uh, and I got some great wisdom from a, a mentor of mine once. He said, um, because this is a land navigation exercise, I meaning you have a compass and you have a map and you have to find yourself in the middle of the woods and you have to continue uh, moving about. His advice to me was, Ben, it doesn't matter how fast you are if you don't know where you're going. That has always stuck with me, not just in the military sense, but in my personal life too. Um, if you don't have a goal, if you don't know where you're going, it you, doesn't matter how fast you are or, or how quickly you get there, because the destination isn't determined. And so um, there's certainly a time and a place for a ready fire aim. But I think the bigger strategic things that you want out of life need to be a ready aim fire. So you you did some things to prepare yourself. Like talk about specific steps because the person listening to you right now could have been doing all the things that you've done to this point, but also 
as you're listening, you might be, this is your first episode and you're listening because Ben's story is interesting. And you're saying, I would like to be prepared. I would like to be able to be quote unquote lucky, right? That I've prepared, my preparation is meeting opportunities. We, we mentioned that you built a land flipping business. What are, what are things that led you both to that and things, other things that you've done that you feel like from a financial perspective, you've equipped yourself um, and made yourself prepared? First, I would, I would highly encourage people to be curious. I remember sitting on city bus transfer, transportation um, because I didn't have a vehicle, didn't have a school bus. So I was trying to get to school. I would read prospectus from various um, uh, wealth advisors or whoever trying to understand how to get myself out of the situation, this financial um, or get get ahead in the financial world. Um, so I, I've always been curious. I've always wanted to grow my and educate myself. And I think that's an important part of it. But you have to be adaptable as well. When you, when you are adaptable, it doesn't matter what is thrown your way because you're going to use your critical thinking skills. You're going to, you're going to seek mentorship or friendships to help you work through those processes. And that creates, um, it creates an adaptable person. So, uh, curiosity, adaptability, and then, um, back to that preparedness thing of mentally tough, physically ready and spiritually open. I think when you have that combination of things, um, you might be really surprised at the opportunities around you, the people you meet. I mean, every time I know you guys say it all the time on the, uh, on the podcast, but, but when you go and meet like-minded people, it is an amazing experience that I, I've started going to live events in my real estate world and my investing world in 2018. And every single time I go to one, I walk away with friendships and mentors that have lasted years and will probably last a lifetime. Um, that, that has been, I have like one of the most shy people you would meet, to be honest. I got stories on that too, if you want to delve into that, but, uh, but, but forcing yourself to get out there and be around like-minded people is so refreshing. And it really helps to build that community that, again, going back to Amy and, and my accident, we didn't know we really had that support network until it was uh, it was go time. And everybody stepped up in such huge ways. Man, th- there's no doubt. Um, that as far as the, your, the preparation, it sounds like you had, like you said, you're curious you had a vision of what, like what you were trying to accomplish and you, you were trying a bunch of different things that sits led you even into live events to try to help navigate that. And then somewhere along the lines, you landed on land flipping. Was there anything in particular that you did to prepare that you was like, man, that's why this was a good fit for me, uh, that somebody else could glean knowledge from. I'm going to plug the investor DNA. Uh, it's helpful. Uh, because, you know, when you come into, when you come into, if you, if you, if we're seeking financial freedom, if we're looking for passive income to, 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 you know, be better, bigger than our monthly expenses, there's so many different ways that can happen. For me, I've done multifamily, I've done uh, short term rentals, I've done single family, single family rentals. Um, I've come to learn that I am not a, I personally am not built for the service um, sector. And so taking phone calls from tenants and and what have you, um, that is not my strong suit. Um, I, I, it's just not what I like. And so I think that's why I was so drawn to the land business because I can automate so much. I can get, I can get a team that helps me. And um, now I will say it's a lot more work up front than I anticipated. But it's been fun too to learn about this business and to grow it um, without the stressors that I had become accustomed to in other real estate fields. And so for me, it's just a good fit. And that's the most crucial thing I could give advice to anybody on is when you're investing, it needs to be the right fit for you. The right fit. That's so good. All right. We're talking about preparing for the next step now, right? Like, you you mentioned that you were retiring here the next couple months. Oh man, what does that look like? Uh, it, 
in words, exciting, nervous. Um, we, if we're following the five stages of grief, uh, I'm full cycle now. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, the accident kind of, uh, that, that, that made the, the timeline speed up. It, it, it quite frankly did. And so, um, there was higher expectations of me from myself and then also from, um, my, my military family that, um, I had many more jobs I could have completed. However, uh, the, this accident was like the nail in the coffin for, for me. And, um, now it's gone from a, 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 a area of concern. And again, this goes back to my community of amazing people that I love and would do anything for because they have got me through some really dark times of, you know, um, of, of wanting to still produce, but my body is not going to produce, uh, the way that, uh, is needed to be in the field that my, has been my whole adult life, my whole career. So, um, I'm, I'm now no longer saddened. I'm, I'm excited because what it does is it gives me the opportunity to finally be with my family. Um, I've had an amazing career. Wouldn't change anything about it, but, um, you know, there's, um, I'm going to butcher it, but there's a Jim Rohn quote about if I had known that it cost, I probably would have paid the price. Um, I've missed a lot of my family's time. And, um, you know, if you, if you, um, if you look at the book that I produced or was produced with Kyle Wilson and a bunch of other great co-authors, um, it kind of goes into that, how, um, um, just lost my train of thought. What was I saying? <laughs> well, just uh, you were talking about the cost, uh, the price that you paid, the things that you've wow. lost, and and I think it must be something that was in the book. Yeah, it's it. it military service is never easy. Um, I would say a harder job might be, or is my spouse's job. Um, Amy is incredible. I love her very much, and she's been through so much with me. Um, but I got all the training I needed for my job. She had never got any of the training she needed to be a single mom for two decades, basically, um, to see me off to war and then welcome me back home. Um, she's a she's a saint, man. I'm excited to be able to pay her back and building these businesses that allow the passive income to support that dream of being here for my family and supporting my family and financially, spiritually, mentally, physically, like all of the things I'm just excited for the next chapter. So, um, I think you for asking about that. Cause I think that's part of that goal setting too, is what's next. What are you doing this for? What, why are you taking action today? And it's so easy to get lost in the day to day, um, you know, miniature details, but if every day we're chipping away at what our, our why is and what our goals are, that's super powerful. And uh, I know I have to keep coming back to those, especially um, when the ruts happen or when you hit that rut. Man, proverbial rut in your t in your case, the literal rut. That uh, <laughs> man, it, it's it's super powerful to hear the story. Um, I do want to point to one thing you just kind of glazed over was the book that you wrote. Um, talk about why the book and how people can get access to that. Cause if they've heard your story so far, they, they're not going to want to miss this opportunity to get a chance. At yeah. So I've, I've had the great pleasure of being on a project with uh, Kyle Wilson, uh, Chris Gronkowski, NFL player, short tank guy, um, Dennis Whaley, Ron White, three time memory champion, like a whole host of amazing, um, authors. I, I think there's, a uh, well, there's, there's a lot of authors, but the name of the book is called The Transformational Journey. Um, our publisher, Kyle Wilson, and the editor, Takara Sites, they did an amazing job with this book, and it's a number one bestseller in over 60 categories on Amazon. And we're just so proud of that project. Um, a lot of the author, or all the authors, you know, pour themselves into this book. And so I encourage anybody that's on their own journey to read those stories. There's a lot of great takeaways and ideas and people that are out there wanting to help. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for that opportunity. And for me, it's just been a way to be, uh, it's really been part of my healing process through tragedy, like my, my accident that we were talking about on this podcast. Well, and, and you so graciously provided people to get 
a a free part of the book, like a, a chapter from it. If uh, if you guys are yeah. interested, go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash Ben, B-E-N, um, to get access to that. You can also purchase the book directly from Amazon on that site and connect with Ben. Ben, if it's okay, just put like, we'll put like your LinkedIn or any way that people will can, can connect with you there. Um, so just wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash Ben. What a great, what a great book. And I'm kind of excited to to read about it. I actually had a chance to meet Ron White. He actually remembered Joey's name. It's easy to remember <laughs> my name. He actually, he does have a great memory. He remembered Joey's name. Now, was that his actual name or his handle of Stallion? We didn't tell him about the Stallion. That would have thrown him off. <laughs> but Ron White, very, very interesting guy. From a service member's perspective, I know you appreciate the ability for him to remember all the names that were lost in, in uh, some of the the Afghan, Iraq war, Gulf war. I'm not certain exactly. I can't remember the details there, but I remember my memory is not so good. I just remembered <laughs> fantastic brain, somebody that I enjoy reading his story right after I read your story. Ben, thank you for coming on, sharing, uh, being open to share. Right, This is probably... A little bit um, hard to share, but also good to share. And for you listening, you're you're trying to figure out how does your story compare, right? Most likely, you probably haven't had the same sort of experiences that Ben has. But what you might have had is a dependent story where you've been dependent in a specific way, both good and bad. And you're questioning the independent route. And you're trying to figure out, does that match your investor DNA. Is there a way for you to build a tribe? Is there a way for you to build passive income that you could be dependent upon instead of an income stream? All of those things are available to you. Just go to wealthwallwallstreet.com for such free call and jump on a call. And then I would encourage you to join us at the next live event where Ben was sharing, meeting people, connecting with people and how that's transformed his life and helped him grow as an investor. You can go to wealthwallwallstreet.com forward slash live and put in the promo code podcast to get a discount. Ben, we appreciate you, brother. It's always good uh, to be with you. I appreciate you guys. Your, your community is second to none, and uh, I will see you at that live event. Can't wait, guys. Thank you so much for your time today. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, have an amazing day. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.